the University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined. Uh, grantsmanship or even uh, obtaining grants is a is a complex uh, process. It's competition, um, like anything else. Uh, you know, uh, some of you will recall, and I think all of you will recall when we had uh, the session on the nineteenth. Uh, the conversation about the fact that in many instances the success rates in those applications is about thirty percent or even less. That sometimes people put in applications for so many grants and 10 grants and you only get one. Um, so one has to understand these processes, understand the expectations of uh, you know, the, the uh, institutions, the foundations that actually give grants. Uh, of course, to know about who you know, grants what nationally, you know, uh, granting. So it's a pleasure today, and if I may, uh, to have uh, uh, Professor Swana Mafuya, who one of my bosses as a member of the board, director of the first and newly established South African Medical Research Council and the University of Johannesburg an African Center for Epidemics uh, Research, which is short in short, PESA, uh, Extra Mirror Unit. She's a professor of ep epidemiology at, in public health in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Johannesburg. She's also a guest lecturer uh, of uh, reproductive biology and reproductive health, and of course, epidemiology at the Pan-African University of Life and Earth Sciences in the African Union. Before joining the University of uh, Johannesburg and taking over the directorship of the center that we've just uh, mentioned, she was Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at Northwest University. She also served prior to that as Executive Director, Search Director, and Chief Research Manager at the HIV and AIDS, STI, and TB Research Program of the Human Sciences Research Council for over 13 years. She was the editor-in-chief and executive editor of an internationally accredited African journal, Sahara Journal. Professor Paswana Mafuya has worked to better understand the epidemiology of HIV in South Africa and South Saharan, South Saharan Africa for almost 20 years. And in the last 10 years, she has paid particular attention to marginalized population that are at high risk for HIV acquisition and transmission. When COVID-19 hit, she played a leading role in conducting groundbreaking COVID-19 studies uh, together with her colleagues and collaborators, uh, which attracted attention, you know, media attention. Uh, she also was awarded the National Science and Technology Forum, the NSTF uh, TW Kambule Award in 2017, in recognition of her outstanding contribution to science, technology, and mathematics for the last 15 years of after her PhD. As I indicated, she has been a member of, and she continues to be a member of the NRF board. She's a member of the Academy of Science of South Africa ASAF Council. She is a member of Higher Education Board and DERA Sengwe AIDS Conference. She's also a scientific advisor on the Scientific Advisory Committee, member of the Health Research Institute, uh, and expert panelist at the International Expert Panel of Infectionology, uh, German Research Foundation. She's a reviewer of uh, grant proposals for the African German Research Network. Uh, health innovation in sub-Saharan Africa. She's an NRF-rated researcher, and of course, uh, she's, uh, she's a fellow of uh, ASAF and uh, the African Academy of Sciences. And of course, the Organization for Women, Science for Development. She recently authored an inspirational and empowerment book on her career journey entitled Vision Never Dies, number one. Learning curves from 
my own non-linear career journey from the village girl to award-winning fighter and academics. She was recently featured in the Fair Lady magazine of March and April 2022 as one of the world-class women scientists. So without further ado, let me hand you over to uh, Professor Filwe, uh, who of course, as always, uh, request her to make a presentation, maybe 30 minutes of her slides, if she's got the slides, uh, and so that we can then have an opportunity uh, to engage. As uh, in the past, I think it would be absolutely important if you can prepare questions, you can put them in the commentary, or in fact, uh, write them down so that you have an opportunity to ask her uh, experiences and of course her knowledge being a reviewer on some of these grants. So over to you, Professor. Thank you very much, Prof. Kaniki, for your kind and patient introduction. I feel very humbled. Uh, you could have just said people can read, you know, especially because we are talking to the future professors here. So I feel honored and greetings to you all. And I must thank uh, uh, Prof. Menon, uh, uh, Megan Stradom, uh, uh, yourself, and all the organizers of this amazing uh, uh, talk this afternoon. Um, I'm going to share uh, the slides. Um, and I, I must say that I am really looking forward to engaging uh, with the group. Uh, it is very difficult to convey a message with regard to grant uh, writing. I've tried my best to summarize, but I think we're going to uh, benefit more when we converse. So I'll try to stick to the 30 minutes. Um, so we are, we are talking about applying for and managing grants both locally and internationally. Um, in my presentation, I'll speak about the papers which uh, Prof. Kanikit already touched on, uh, why grant applications, challenges in grant application, uh, practical tips, you know, uh, based on own experience, and then I will uh, wrap up. Um, as it has already been mentioned, I've uh, been involved in um, uh, writing grant applications, in uh, reviewing uh, grant applications, um, uh, both uh, nationally and internationally. And I have been able to secure the ones that you are seeing. Well, it's just a, 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 a few, well, not a few, but the selected ones. Um, uh, and you will hear my story. Uh, uh, when Prof. Kaniki was introducing me to assess it, he has seen uh, some of my notes. Um, yeah, it looks like I am stuck now. I can move. It's, it's, it's about grant and stuff. Sorry. My slides are not moving. Let's see what's going on. Pardon me. Okay, next slide. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought to take you a little bit on uh, past uh, projects which were funded by like Make AIDS Foundation, uh, the International Labor Organization, GIZ, NIH, CDC, uh, Ghana AIDS Commission. I'm sure you can see how um, diverse they are and the range of amounts and the, the type of topics. And in terms of current projects, uh, 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 currently working on the SMR, SAMRC funded studies, um, uh, GES 4.0, which is uh, uh, run by our university, uh, uh, IDRC is an application that went out. Uh, NIH, we were successful. Uh, we are still finalizing the uh, documentation. 
Now I'll be speaking with you from uh, experiences drawn out of uh, my engagements uh, with grant applications in this regard. I thought it will just give you a nice overview. Um, why raise external funding? Um, we know that resources are critical, you know, to drive knowledge and innovation, um, uh, which is quite critical for finding solutions to our uh, problems. And research is not cheap. No single institution has sufficient resources, you know, to provide for all the uh, wonderful research that is needed. And so it is uh, on those grounds that, you know, for, uh, we are to seek external funding in order to conduct the research that we wish to conduct. So it is a, a forced choice uh, uh, because uh, you either have to not do it and therefore not conduct the studies of the magnitude that you wish to conduct uh, or uh, get on the tough task of uh, grant writing. Um, now, it is not easy, and, and Prof Andrew alluded to this. Uh, the funding landscape is highly complex and competitive. Um, and applying for grants is very time consuming, uh, requires dedicated effort and time amidst, you know, complete competing priorities, backlogs. Uh, not having adequate uh, support systems, and at times still developing uh, grant writing uh, uh, and management skills, and sometimes working in, in environments that are not as conducive, uh, 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 you know, having to uh, uh, balance uh, between various um, uh, uh, tasks. But I like what Albert Einstein says, in the middle of every difficulty lies an opportunity. And I, I can assure you that many people who have succeeded, the, uh, uh, you know, things were not leveled first. They uh, were persuaded and did everything, uh, uh, you know, against all odds, you know, to achieve their uh, vision. And I just want to encourage you as we uh, go through the next slides that let's be positive. It has been done, it is being done, therefore we can, it can be, be done even by yourselves. And I, I wanna first um, uh, uh, relate to you my struggles. I like to talk about my struggles because oftentimes when we see success, uh, you know, we, 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 do, we, we like it, but we don't know what goes uh, uh, behind it and sometimes we, we can't even imagine that some people have been where uh, uh, you might be at. So as a young scientist, I experienced struggles in generating external uh, income uh, as an unknown newcomer in the space, uh, having no um, income generation profile, no track record to attract resources, no grant writing skills, no grant funding partnerships, alliances, and collaborations. And my submissions were not adequately aligned at times with the funder schools, uh, uh, as well as with the uh, national, regional, and global priorities. And the open and extensive and uh, complex grant application, grant application process had many rules and criteria that I couldn't adequately meet. And I had, on the other hand, competing priorities and uh, admin responsibilities, uh, teaching responsibilities. So many doors were slammed on my face and my grant applications were outrightly declined. Uh, this was a, an incredibly challenging period that required courage, focus, dedicated effort and a support system. And I must tell you that at this time, I really wanted to give up, you know, I asked myself, uh, you know, do I have to put myself through this? Uh, and I'm glad that I never gave up. Now, I'm going to share with you the practical tips on applying for and managing grants. Uh, and uh, my book uh, is, is uh, 
getting finalized, uh, so I drew heavily uh, from it. Now, first thing is to understand the landscape. Uh, we already mentioned how tough the funding landscape is. And in this period of uh, uh, financial austerity, it's even worse where there are limited opportunities and more restrictions. So uh, things are getting tougher and tougher, but they are still successful uh, grant applications. So of greatest importance is to understand the application process, the requirements, deadlines, forms, instructions, uh, funding amount, duration of funding, uh, et cetera, uh, of the respective funders. Know their, uh, the funder's research agenda, their expectations, their areas of interest, their missions uh, and programming um, priorities. Uh, know the type of funding opportunities uh, 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 and guidelines and requirements. And also take time to assess profiles of organizations that have been funded previously or individuals that were, were previously funded. And how do you do this practically? Uh, you can uh, read the funders annual reports, visit um, the funders website, obtain the funders brochure, identify a contact person and their details of, uh, of the respective funding organizations and email them to seek clarity. Uh, you know, so there are various ways of, of, of ensuring that you understand what is expected. And I've put here a, a few um, screenshots of some of the funders like the Welcome Trust, uh, they delineate the, the, the application process. Uh, this is on their website. Uh, 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 and, and as you can see, they provide the scheme at a glance, uh, the eligibility and suitability, what they offer, how to apply. And they also uh, show the process uh, uh, that it, it will take, you know, uh, applications open, deadline, shortlisting and interviews. Um, uh, also, uh, uh, the NIH, they have a web page that uh, takes you through how, uh, how on, on how to uh, prepare for an NIH grant. Um, uh, and and I, I need to hint that it is important, you know, with uh, institutions like uh, NIH to, to work with uh, people that have been uh, funded before to also attend their training because uh, their process is very intricate. Um, Women Arise a program of IDRC uh, also on the website. Uh, uh, you follow a two-stage process of submitting um, an executive, uh, well, not executive summary, but an initial concept note, then a full proposal. And we applied for this uh, last year and we didn't get it. I'll talk about the success rate uh, uh, soon, soon. So it is important uh, to diversify uh, uh, funding uh, uh, sources, like don't apply uh, just to one particular a funding organization. So, uh, and what needs to be understood is the requirements are varied and some are unique. So it is important to really carefully look at what each funding body requires uh, and to look at where you stand a good chance in terms of where you are at, uh, your strengths and the type of research question that you are looking at. Uh, and uh, you also uh, should take note of how each funding organization um, uh, operate in terms of uh, available opportunities. For example, some do requests for proposals, some uh, a, 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 a respond to invitations. In some cases, it's a subcontract, uh, you know, with some collaborator who might have gotten a bigger grant. In some cases, uh, cooperative agreements uh, like CDC, um, uh, uh, and in some cases is training fellowships. I mean, for example, Welcome Trust has various type of grants, including training fellowships. And there are charities, there are foundations, there are government departments. Uh, uh, in some cases, they use uh, 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 tenders uh, 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 and whatnot. Um, uh, so, um, 
it can be also that it's an industry partnership, uh, you know, through which, uh, you know, funding can be secured. I can tell you from my experience, it's important to be open to all this kind of uh, uh, opportunities. In fact, uh, my funding was secured through all these types of methods that I've spoken about. Um, uh, uh, I recall, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, engaging with GIZ about the work that I was doing, which led to a, a, a three-year cooperative agreement uh, of four million rent and a, an international expert from Germany uh, spending three years, uh, you know, it was one of those unprecedented uh, uh, ways of securing funding, especially in the organization that I was at, at the time. So uh, it is important to always represent what you do well and be able to convey it to the next person such that it becomes difficult for them to say no. Um, moving forward, Looks, I'm stuck again. Yeah, this is an example of an RFA from the SAMRC. This is one of, I mean, uh, we responded to this RFA and we were successful. Uh, 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 the Pan African Center for Epidemics Research was established following a successful application in this regard. Um, uh, we first did an explosion of interest um, uh, uh, and then later submitted a full proposal. That's how generally the SAMRC uh, works. Um, uh, and IDRC also had a call for proposals and they have a grant application kit. We applied for this. Uh, we submitted a concept note and later a full proposal. Unfortunately, we were not successful. Now. I'm going to talk about what uh, uh, I believe are important tips for winning uh, uh, proposals. Like it is important to exhibit the significance of the proposed work in terms of uh, uh, its public purpose uh, and also focus uh, or research agenda uh, so that it looks sustainable and one can uh, clearly deduce that this is science for society, which will contribute to uh, impacting lives, uh, 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 ch changing lives and transforming lives. So generating external funding is not about just chasing numbers, but, but it, it is about making a difference. It is about closing gaps. Uh, so uh, identifying those and uh, uh, Subpopulations not reached, high impact areas, high risk and vulnerable groups uh, will help a, a, a lot in demonstrating that the work that is being done is important, it, uh, will inform public health action in my field uh, uh, and is in line with the national development goals and the uh, uh, SDGs, is policy relevant, is development focused, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, that is one very important area uh, that uh, one must always uh, be very circumspect about. Um, here I'm just showing different avenues that can constitute public purpose, like whether you are addressing human capital, physical capital, financial, social, uh, and, and, and so on. And some of the examples are really public health related given my background. Um, uh, uh, our unit, uh, the, the Pan-African Center for Epidemics Research, which is PESA, uh, is the first um, extramural unit of the SAMRC uh, at UJ. Uh, so that must tell you um, about the strategicness, for lack of a better word, uh, of, of our choice to pursue that because it made it easy to say there's a gap here. There are 28 SAMRC units across uh, different institutions and at UJ we didn't have. So we tapped on that opportunity and we showed the gap that we would, we would close. And we also uh, tapped on the fact that we were in the middle of a pandemic and we could see how we were caught unprepared. And we said, we need 
to understand local epidemics and also equip the next generation, uh, you know, in terms of skills in handling and managing epidemics so that we are prepared for the future. And we were listened to. Um, and listen to what the president of the MRC said, Prof. Glenda Gray. She says, when we looked at our choices for extramural units, we wanted to look forward to what the world's going is going to look like in the next 10 to 20 years and position the SAMRC to not only respond to the diseases of the past and present, but to pivot to the future, to be prepared for future pandemics and work towards making South Africa resilient. And then she mentioned how the work contributes to uh, national goals. And she then talks about um, what uh, our, the focus of PESA would be, including cutting edge Pan-African and global research, epidemiological and public health studies among marginalized population in diverse low resource settings and so on. You can clearly see that it was quite important for them to see that this work is relevant, topical, and, and for public purpose, uh, like it will make a significant contribution uh, uh, to the country and to the region. And I uh, uh, also uh, elaborated on the work that we are doing in terms of uh, uh, public health significance, multidisciplinarity, innovativeness, local relevance, and so on. So this is quite important when you, you are uh, applying for funding to convince everyone that you know the work is worth uh, investing in. And of course, our university was very happy, the chancellor, all messages coming through and the vice chancellor. And, and here I'm showing another example of uh, a, a study with clear cut public papers where we wanted to ensure that, uh, 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 you know, in, in the first place, we get people tested for HIV early enough and put them on treatment early and retain them on uh, ART uh, uh, until they achieve viral load suppression. This contributes uh, directly uh, to, to uh, national health goals, uh, especially ahead of 2030, where we are wanting to control uh, HIV as an epidemic. Now, uh, that's what I mean when I talk about uh, public purpose. Another important uh, aspect to uh, uh, consider is long-term sustainability. You know, uh, working in a particular area and developing a track record on that. Consistency is key. If, uh, if uh, one is applying for funding and they demonstrate lack of focus, it becomes very difficult for the funder to be convinced that you have the requisite uh, knowledge and skills to carry out the job uh, or the research that you are proposing, um, engaging, showing clearly that this is not just you, but there is local support um, uh, and international support, uh, uh, you know, co-ownership and buy-in, uh, speaks speak a lot to long-term sustainability um, and also being able to demonstrate that the work that is being proposed is not just for now it can uh, it will remain relevant for a long time to come uh, uh, you know uh, showing the strategic focus and and also how you'll go about ensuring that people are attuned to the work that you do like disseminating, uh, what you are doing in various ways. Uh, so that is one critical aspect. And when applying, it's also critical to show the feasibility of the proposed work. And I'm talking here about having a smart plan. You know, this is, uh, the, the, the uh, smart is often spoken about, you know, simple, measurable, achievable, realistic time frame. Like it shows that you know where you are, where you want to go and why you want to go there. Uh, and one can be convinced that, uh, you know, uh, the work is doable. Uh, having a log frame, showing, uh, uh, you know, what inputs, activities, outputs and impacts will be achieved. and a clear cut monitoring and evaluation plan uh, because the funder wants to know that really this work is uh, doable. Um, uh, and I'm uh, putting here um, 
a log frame of one of the proposals that we submitted, which we were successful on. You can see how much thinking went into each aspect to say, what inputs are we gonna need for this project? What activities will this involve? What will the outputs be? What will outcomes be? What will the impacts be? Uh, 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 so, so that thoroughness becomes uh, very critical. And um, uh, here we, we're demonstrating uh, the outcomes that we will measure, clear cut. What implementation outcomes will we measure? What service outcomes will we measure? Uh, 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 and what uh, knowledge translation do we envisage uh, will happen? Uh, uh, and also it is showing you know, the uh, formative process outcome and impact evaluations, uh, as well as continuous monitoring of, of our activities. Um, and this came also from a different uh, a proposal where we had to show key success factors, you know, that we will be monitoring as uh, we implement the project and short-term outcomes as well as long-term outcomes. Again, each and every aspect had to be well thought through uh, because you always have to think about the kind of competition uh, that you are faced with and, and being smarter and uh, proactive and, and really uh, thinking outside the box uh, becomes uh, very critical. Um, uh, uh, this is uh, my own innovation. I say adopt the AIMS approach because business as usual uh, might not work. Uh, a for ambitious, you know, uh, like think big about uh, uh, what you are pursuing, uh, be innovative, get, you know, like think new ideas, new diagnostic tools, new models, new methods, latest approaches, and, and so on, really seek to make a real difference. Uh, I'm saying this because many a times it's, it's very scary to chat uncharted crowns. I mean, the work that I currently do, I always say to people, don't ask me how is it, will it evolve? I'm evolving with it because it's innovative. I have not done it before. I have not seen it being done before, but that's what becomes very exciting. And even for pandas, they, they do understand that this is research. That's why you are doing it. You, you don't have answers. So it's, it is not like you are expected to uh, 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 be a prophet or a prophetess, but at least show that the risk is calculated. Now, I'm giving you an example of a project that we are running, uh, which is about harnessing big heterogeneous uh, uh, data uh, among key, population, key populations. And um, so what we are doing, we are building a flexible and comprehensive and accessible data warehouse collating all HIV-related data and auxiliary data uh, from the year 2000. Um, so uh, what is uh, this big heterogeneous data? We are collecting research data uh, uh, from observational studies, from experimental uh, studies, from quasi, excuse me, experimental studies, uh, data from uh, 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 programs like routine data settings, uh, um, including health records, registers, uh, reports. We are collecting auxiliary data, uh, 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 you know, geospatial uh, data, census data. And we are uh, uh, putting together this data uh, in order to analyze it using machine learning techniques, you know, going beyond traditional uh, statistical methods using what is called uh, uh, SI methods, uh, uh, which are size, size area estimations. We are using uh, uh, trans HIV transmission modeling techniques like, like uh, population attributable fraction modeling, um, you know, trying to answer research questions that have not been answered before. Uh, the, the process of merging and harmonizing this requires multiple expertise, data science, computer science, epidemiology, uh, statistics, uh, geography, highly 
you know, I mean, and we proposed this and we got funded and now we have begun amassing the data and now we have begun building the data warehouse and so on. So it's exciting work. And that's what the funder, uh, funders would like to see. They must see that boldness uh, and, uh, you know, an exciting uh, work that uh, can really uh, 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 develop uh, skills. Um, so here is just an outline of what uh, the methods for this study entail. I need not bog you down with the details. Uh, the point I wanted to make is it has to be uh, 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 um, bold, you know, ambitious, and so on. And we are also doing another study on epidemiologic analysis of the impacts of COVID-19. And, and, and because we saw that the, there's limited resources, there are questions that need to be answered. Instead of continuously collecting primary data, we had to ask ourselves, do we, in terms of the data that we have, is it uh, optimized? Uh, can it be used better? So here, we are also bringing data uh, and, and doing some analysis to answer questions. Uh, for example, since COVID-19, there have been uh, 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 services, health services that have been impacted on health outcomes that uh, uh, were affected. And we want to characterize and quantify uh, those impacts to look at changes, patterns, and trends uh, over time, and to uh, also compare innovative interventions that uh, were, were put in place, whether they were effective or not, uh, assessing facilities, you know, that had such services, uh, you know, or innovations with those that didn't and so on. I mean, this cost just thinking uh, uh, because you do it behind the desk. So funders are more and more looking for people who, who think outside the box and who can do more with less. In short scientific rigor, that much we know, you know, uh, that uh, one has to show that they have thoroughly thought about their methodology. And this is quite critical, uh, especially in terms of uh, uh, being proactive, you know, to mention what the methodology you are using can and cannot do, and to show that you've seriously considered uh, 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 whatever weaknesses or limitations, and that you have a plan of, of addressing those, and, and the fact that even if there are some aspects of internal validity that are a limitation or external validity in terms of generalizability that are a limitation you have thought through that and that is the best uh, uh, methodology that uh, you know can be used under the circumstances so you it is it is uh, uh, critical also to show that uh, the work you are proposing is of high quality and to get to that it is an, an iterative process. And I talk about the five Cs, you know, in, uh, demonstrating the comprehensibility of your application, the completeness, the comprehensiveness, coherence, and concise. I mean, comprehensibility and comprehensiveness and comp sound like the same thing, but to me, they don't, you know, because it has to be understood. Uh, uh, and, and, and it has to be uh, involved all aspects that need to be involved and you must make sure that your application is complete and there are no gaps. So uh, I always think about the reviewer that's gonna look at my work and whether they'll be satisfied. I always think about non-specialists that are gonna look at my work, will they understand what I'm saying? Uh, 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 while at the same time, my application reflects, should reflect professionalism and uh, uh, and that takes a lot of revisions, a lot of uh, 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 um, um, consultations. You know, getting people to give input and taking uh, uh, criticism well, and really improving and ensuring that the layout is good, such that you can clearly answer the who, what, when, why, how, uh, and so on with ease. Um, uh, uh, also, uh, in my experience, uh, I found the importance of um, working under experienced individuals initially. Uh, uh, you know, I talked about my early career struggles. 
uh, uh, in my case, it was mentors that initiated me into grant writing um, uh, and involved me, uh, you know, in impressive, uh, in the impressive work they are doing and gradually, because it is a process, doesn't happen overnight. And it's, uh, hence I was saying, it's difficult to even share uh, how to go about uh, writing grants because it is that experiential learning that really develops superior skills. Um, and I am here with my mentee, um, uh, uh, like I was taught, uh, uh, you know, under experienced uh, mentors, I make it my business to have mentees that work with me in the writing um, applications uh, and so on. And I just want her to just in a few sentences say what the experience has been as a newcomer. I've spoken about my experience as a newcomer in writing, writing grant applications. Uh, uh, with me. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you, Prof, for the opportunity. Uh, really, uh, writing grant application as a newly PhD graduate, it has been a deep learning curve, but I have learned so much in such a short space of time, knowing how to respond to the grant proposal, knowing how I did not even know that a budget itself it's a proposal on its own. So I learned under the mentorship of Prof that, you know, the budget needs to really speak to the proposal from the beginning to the finishing. And also I thought as professors, it was that easy. You just put things together. But I've seen is a process, it's an iterative process that you think and rethink. Mm. And certain times we had to rethink the idea the day two. She would wake up and say, Edith, no, that idea is not going to work. But it didn't mean we were going to start from scratch because we had done a lot of work. So mm -hmm. that really also taught me that if you need to get anything that is uh, exceptional, you need to really go through that iterative process and really working under an experienced mentor goes a long way. And I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Edith is the co-founder of PESA. Uh, she was the only person I had when uh, I did the grant application uh, for the establishment of PESA plus the Research Capacity Development Grant, which we also obtained in 2021. She was the only person I had. Uh, and because of that, she has become, uh, uh, she had to, to evolve very fast and, and be a jack of all trades. Uh, I'm very, very proud of her. I mean, uh, uh, as she said, uh, for me, I'm investing in her so that she can take over PESA, and I have no doubt that she will do that. Uh, I'm uh, um, being mindful of my time. I'm going to be very quick with the rest of the slides. Uh, prepare grant application with collaborators. That's one thing I have done for the rest of my life. As a result, um, uh, uh, I find it very difficult to think about uh, uh, great ideas and bold ideas with uh, just the limited resources that you, you have. Uh, uh, because um, once you collaborate, then you have uh, resources and resourceful, the resourcefulness of other people in terms of ideas, uh, uh, you know, views, best practice, and so on. You, uh, uh, the sharing of resources across institutions, uh, you know, uh, pursuing common goals and uh, basically doing such impactful work that becomes uh, more visible because there are many institutions involved. Uh, and, and that complementarity is quite key uh, in terms of also securing long-term funding. Uh, I will tell you that were it not for my collaboration, it would have been difficult to um, secure multi-year, multi-million, multi-country uh, studies uh, just on my own. So together with my collaborators, we jointly responded to requests for proposals and maximized on our combined individual and institutional resources and obtained focused supports and secured different types of resources, some of which I wasn't even uh, aware of uh, myself. So I will, I, I mean, if you look here, these are uh, some of uh, the successful uh, uh, grant applications with collaborators. Uh, uh, it was only like at the beginning when I, uh, when I was younger that I, I would do a small 
uh, a proposal alone and whatnot. Uh, for over uh, 20 years now, I've been working with a range of collaborators. I've had South-South collaborations. Uh, here, for example, I collaborated with 10 African countries uh, and I had, uh, I was the overall um, uh, investigator, principal investigator, and I had uh, local uh, principal investigators that had local teams in 10 countries. And I literally went to the 10 countries and worked with those teams and they exhibited the studies uh, and made input as co-leaders in the study. And that was real living, you know, for me. Um, and then uh, another South-South collaboration example, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in, in, in Ghana, and we continue actually to collaborate. And you can see multiple multidisciplinary teams, multiple institutions, look at the amount of money, 908 uh, US dollars. I mean, uh, huge sums of money and large scale work. And, uh, here also is an example now of a North-South collaboration working with U.S. collaborators from Emory and Johns Hopkins and getting 1.8 million U.S. Uh, dollars. Um, a, a grant application requires resilience. You, you keep trying and never give up. And this now talks to what Prof. Andrew talked about. I mean, in 2021, we applied for six uh, grants and we got two, which is about 30% success rate. And what I have learned over the years is to accept uh, any rejection with grace. I, 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 I once had a rejected grant that I so badly needed. Um, uh, it would have uh, taken me out of academic work, I would have uh, focused on my research only, they would have paid my salary, they would have paid the team that I worked with, and I was so sure that I will get it. And that taught me a lesson that never uh, 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 predict an application. There are so many factors that get looked at. Having ensured the quality, having uh, 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 being bold, having in uh, short thoroughness as far as possible, you still uh, uh, may not get it. Remember, you don't know what other people are proposing. Remember, you don't know what the institution at that time would really, really, really love to pursue. Even if you know their programmatic uh, priorities, they might find a certain idea to be quite fitting squarely to what they want. Uh, and all I wanna say is I passed through strings of failures I, I've even lost count of how many proposals have been unsuccessful, but I achieved repeated successes from those repeated failures. Uh, so resilience is needed. Uh, and and I, I believe that that resilience is brought about by the burning desire, you know, to, to contribute something with the knowledge and skills you have. And I often advise that in your uh, proposal, think about the research out outputs just you know, at the beginning. Have a, a, a research output plan uh, uh, mentioned directly or indirectly because it depends on the structure of the proposal that you are required to give. But give the person the, 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 the thinking that you are about goals, you are about uh, 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 bringing out something out of the work that you are doing, thinking of doing systematic reviews, doing, doing protocol papers, uh, and uh, uh, the students that you can align with your project. Mobilize support from stakeholders. Um, uh, have a strong capacity building component. That is very, very, very critical. Uh, I, I think I'll talk about it during the discussion. I mean, this is one of the plans that you, I, uh, we put in our proposal to show how the work that we are proposing will strengthen capacities. You know, uh, uh, one had to thoroughly think uh, how, uh, you know, is this going to build the next generation? Um, today, PESA has this stuff as had been proposed who are uh, 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 developing scientists. Um, uh, now, <laughs> this is like last but one slide um, about managing grants. 
uh, when you have acquired funding, um, you, you then need to make sure that you deliver on a, 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 a budget and, and time frame uh, and within the specifications that you have indicated in your application. And in my experience, this requires a hands-on approach. And by mentioning hands-on approach, I don't mean micromanaging. You, I mean, I can almost imagine that if one micromanages, uh, you will not have the opportunity to really do the science that you need to focus on. But by hands-on approach, I mean not distancing myself from what is happening on the ground. Uh, making sure that there are plans for every person involved, making sure that uh, different functions are assigned to different people and they are uh, monitoring tools, you know, setting up reporting mechanisms. For example, at uh, SAMRC, we have the RIMS uh, reporting mechanism where we put every output and whatnot. There's someone who is assigned to do that. There are quarterly reports that are being done. The project manager does that. All I do is just to check. Um, a, a, a developing standard operating procedures. I, I really, really found this to be very, very useful as a managing tool for, 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 for grants. You know, uh, where you take every aspect and thresh it out to say, okay, how, how, where do we start, you know, in terms of this study? Okay, we're going to start by uh, 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 training the project staff and then, okay, how is that training going to happen? Then do an SOP for the training, you know, basically thinking resource persons that will be needed to execute that training. Uh, uh, who the, who will the audience of that training be? What skills will we be wanting to build? Like, doing that job you hate to do probably because you've got the science waiting for you but, uh, by being thorough with sop on every milestone you have already done the work because you will use that as your monitoring tool and a reference point of where we are at you know troubleshoot knowing what is what was the previous step and what is the next step and where are we at in terms of where we are going it's so critical having SOPs, having MNE plan, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a metrics fashion, having a log frame like I alluded to earlier on, those are all tools that together, they manage the work for you. Uh, and I always say, I don't manage people, I manage the work. So, uh, 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 and, and I've seen people get out of their comfort zones, young scientists, you know, knowing that when we have international collaborators meeting to report on where each one of us is, I'm not gonna report for anybody. I'm gonna report on the core and then others have other roles. They are not peripheral. Uh, uh, and uh, when I say core, I do not mean uh, others do peripheral work. They do work that complements the science that, that I, I'm doing. So it teaches a, a, a young scientists a lot of responsibility and so on. So close monitoring and supervision, quite important, like having weekly meeting at first like everybody being on their toes to check where are we at what where are we what are we doing and i can tell you it's possible i mean i work with international collaborators and we are able to meet every week uh, and it takes quite a lot of load from one's shoulders uh, because I, I, I probably would not be sleeping if I wasn't having those weekly meetings. And as time goes on, we can change weekly meetings to bi-weekly meetings. And as time goes on, we can have monthly meetings. You know, uh, as the project evolves, we know the amount of work that is needed to take for the project to take off. And then we put all effort. And then as time goes on, we relax and we, we and so on. So. Um, uh, 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 tailoring activities towards uh, your reporting uh, targets and, uh, and outputs is, uh, is also important, like being goal directed all the time and ensuring that there's adherence to the budget, uh, having a trained uh, grant manager. Uh, uh, you know, that will uh, ensure that the specifications of the funder are adhered to. Uh, and and securing dedicated research time. When I was DVC, I, I you know the 
lot of academic staff would, would talk about the difficulty of them running projects while they are doing exams, marking scripts, uh, you know, workload issues, competing practice, qualitative stress, quantitative stress, and so on. Um, and we put some mechanisms, you know, to say, okay, how about also checking workloads and, and have some of the uh, staff having lower teaching load in the first um, uh, 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 quarter and then uh, 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 take more work in the next quarter uh, 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 and so on. How about research leave? How about, you know, trying to create some flexibility uh, uh, because with the research and like uh, uh, teaching, uh, it, it, there's no structured uh, 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 or a structure to do it. You create uh, that structure within the context you are in. And of course, one other way is to ensure that your teaching incorporates research so that as you teach, you are also researching and so on. So thinking outside the box, bottom line is, it's doable. Uh, ensuring uh, that one has a strong project management team is very, very important. And by the way, project management team uh, skills are, uh, are different from scientific skills. You can be a wonderful scientist, but a very bad project manager. Uh, I always say my project management ends with really having tools, uh, uh, having uh, 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 roles assigned, and having the right people who don't have to be policed to do the work. Uh, if I have a, the kind of team that does not have a shared vision uh, and uh, that is gonna be chased around to do the work, I will, I will decimally fail. So, so it is about you know, thinking about those uh, practical issues that will uh, relieve one out of uh, uh, the, the, the heaviness of all the activities that need to take place. Uh, uh, needless to say, the budget must be realistic, must, uh, it must be sufficient or adequate enough to perform the tasks that you know, ha have been requested. And like Dr. Edith said, it is a proposal on its own. Uh, you can have a marvelous uh, proposal, uh, but if you don't have uh, uh, the budget that complements it, speaks to, to the aspect with clear cut justification, uh, you know, that shows that your, your pricing is reasonable and that there's a uh, value for money. With the budget only, you can uh, lose the opportunity of, of, of getting the funding. Yeah, yeah uh, I thank you very much. Uh, I hope we can engage and I hope we, uh, we still have enough time to do so. There we are. Thank you very much. I, uh, you know, thanks for the, the, the you know, the, the, everything that you have put across. It probably has relieved me from the punishment I, you know, I suffered as a NRF executive to worry about people, you know, complaining about the fact that we just don't like them when we don't fund. But um, that's not to say that uh, you, as of course the, the board member, that we should constantly strive to find funding. Uh, to fund, uh, you know, uh, fundable proposals. Um, but of course, not with budgets where in the olden days, I remember, you know, earlier people would actually submit a proposal with a budget and say miscellaneous and anything else. Nobody looks at miscellaneous these days because we don't have money to deal with miscellaneous. But thank you very much for your presentation. Colleagues, we now have uh, time to have conversations and questions. Um, while you're thinking about questions, you can, of course, and raise your hands. I saw comments flying around, uh, positive comments. Uh, Professor Het uh, van, you know, van West Eisen was talking about just how your presentation reflects most of, you know, the, you know, the whole review criteria that um, you know that that there is uh, and goes back to 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 the basics of uh, you know what you know research which we talk about the whole process of, of, of research and preparing even at the early stage of an academic proposal but expanding it beyond that um any questions specific questions uh, if people have uh, 
Um, hands uh, up. Uh, Khair, do you want to uh, um, make some inputs? Uh, yes, Andrew, no, thank you. I am uh, really appreciative uh, of the presentation and our speaker, how knowledgeable she is and how she's talking from experience. So I am really trusting that all of us can uh, follow her model of, uh, you know, going for uh, the applications, uh, going through the experiences and learning from the experiences. Uh, and if we can do that together with the models like uh, that we have around us, that is uh, just a, a huge uh, privilege. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I see uh, Witness and then Gladys. If Witness can go ahead, please. Thank you, Prof. Uh, for me, uh, it's not a question, Prof. Uh, just an appreciation for, for the knowledge shared because it was not visiting us as future professors. It came with reality in terms of what we're gonna face going forward. So I feel like it is a very good gospel. So going forward, if it can be allowed to reach out as the last light allows or dictate, uh, if we can be allowed to reach out to, to Prof, that will be so appreciative. Thank you, Professor. Indeed, and, and as she indicated, there is always a beginning. All of us start from somewhere. And I like the slide you put there in terms of your early challenges, and I'll come back to that. Uh, but first, let me give Gladys a chance. Uh, Gladys, you had your hand up. Thank you very much, Prof. Ripiwe, for a very insightful talk. And I want to ask that from your experience, you've worked with so many collaborators. What has informed your your choice of these collaborators. Yeah. And also you touched on the issue of support and you mentioned having mentors and that has been noted, but what are, what are some of the other types of support that you have received along your journey? Absolutely. Uh, Professor Refilo, let me just add on, on this issue of collaboration. One of the, the the fears of an early career, or even as an early, or you know, your person who's going into collaboration, worry about you know what will happen to my ideas and intellectual property, and when I share with with this, will I lose everything? How did you? How have you come to work around and maneuver around and say, well, you know, perhaps through sharing, I'm gaining? Um, yeah. Over to you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, and I've uh, noted the sentiments uh, uh, about the appreciation of the work shared and I'd be very glad to continue to engage with some of the participants in sharing my experiences and so on. Uh, coming to the questions, uh, ladies, what informed the choice of collaborators? Uh, it was uh, uh, the niche area uh, that I had developed. Uh, so I looked at uh, collaborators that had a mutual interest, uh, who were in organizations uh, that had um, a profile uh, that would uh, uh, complement uh, the profile of my institution. So at an individual level, uh, I look at also complementarity of skills and knowledge. Um, I, I, and I, I looked at values as well, uh, uh, because I have found that having had, uh, for example, collaborators from Johns Hopkins for over 10 years, um, uh, it is our values the belief in uh, making a contribution uh, in public health and the belief in working with marginalized population that has driven us to always uh, uh, stay uh, together. Uh, uh, and then, and, and, um, and I, I do like to uh, uh, comment on keeping the collaborators because it's one thing to chop and change collaborators, it's another 
uh, to have collaborative tests over time uh, because then you get to know how you work. You become friends, actually, uh, and you, you move faster with things. You hit the ground running together uh, and so on. So, um, yeah, that's that. And if we had time, I would have told you how tough it was at first, you know, to establish those collaborations. But I am a go-getter, you know. I, I mean, I wrote to more than 100 people that had areas of mutual interest and only one responded. But even that one is not the one that I ended up collaborating with. So it, it's uh, those are stories I, I, I tell in other <laughs> places. Uh, uh, so in terms of types of support received in my journey, yo, yes, very, very important question because um, uh, indeed it is not just mentors, although they were very, very critical because they made me to believe in myself. They uh, uh, showed me opportunities and, and, and showed me doors that I could not have accessed on my own and so on. Uh, but I found institutional support to be very, very critical. Um, a, 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 a conducive en environment that allows you to grow where you, you, you know, and flexible work environments. Uh, in one of the presentation, for example, I spoke about where I once decided to quit you know, because the responsibilities of motherhood and wifehood and uh, uh, working and doing my research, which I loved so much, were just not becoming visible uh, uh, with my little children. Uh, uh, but it was the institutional support that kept me going where I was allowed to work from home and, and, and so on and so on. So, so uh, institutional uh, 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 I always say your line manager, uh, if they share the vision with you, uh, your institution, if it provides conducive uh, environment, uh, the networks that I belong to, uh, uh, you know, uh, African Academy of Science, Organization for Women in Science, uh, ASAF, you know, and NRF, I get uh, rejuvenated, new ideas and whatnot. I found that intertwining myself with networks and also in terms of life in general, surrounding myself with positive minded people like that always say you go girl, even if they don't understand sometimes what you are doing, like being selective and, 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 and also managing one's time. Uh, 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 choosing what to do and what not to do and not worrying about, you know, whatever else that everybody will think of in this patriarchal society, not doing some of the things that other women do, you know. So, um, and then the, the last question on how did I, uh, de like, uh, address the fact that my ideas uh, would, uh, might not, uh, uh, you know, I might, might be lost uh, in the equation, you know, of working with people. Um, uh, I'm talking here of true collaboration. And true collaboration recognizes the fact that uh, each and every collaborator is bringing something to the table that others don't know. Absolutely. I wouldn't dare work yeah. with people that see me as a, a flower pot, you know? Uh, uh, and I have been uh, blessed in, in that regard because, you know, initially there were times, you know, because of socialization, there are things that I also had to outgrow, you know, where I would become reserved about some of the things that I could have said, you know? Uh, 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 but I was blessed with uh, collaborators that uh, showed my value edge. And sometimes even when I say, maybe I can't contribute there, you know, they were the first one to say, Rufilo, we depend on you, you know? Um, and uh, having a vision, uh, uh, you know, nothing can sway you away from your vision. So, so, um, that has also assisted me in maintaining that which I want to pursue. You know, uh, I always say, you know, we need health equity. You know, uh, we need to close disparities in health. 
that's me. Nobody is going to stop me from that. Uh, if I had been with collaborators that uh, seemed to sway me in another direction, I obviously would not have been able to continue with them. And, and, and the other way uh, around is also true. Collaborators want somebody that adds value, somebody that they feel they can not do without, you know, so, so because they want those synergies and best practices, you know, and they must feel it is not just their mind only, but even others' uh, ideas and so on. Thank you very much uh, for that. Let me ask uh, uh, Pat Menon uh, to ask a question, and then I'll come to Sabelo. He has written down questions, but I would like him to ask himself, uh, unless he's feeling shy to say, which I don't <laughs> think Sabelo ever feels shy. Over to you, Kate. Uh Prof. Rafilwe, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation, as always. Um, I wanted to ask a question. So very often, researchers in Africa, especially in the field of science and health sciences, when they receive uh, grant funding from overseas uh, agencies, there's often the subtext of whether Africa is being used as a subject for exploration, um, mm. you know, targeted, like for, you know, like when they had uh, trials, uh, yeah. clinical trials in Africa, mm. and mm. not in their own countries. Mm. I was just wondering if you could, uh, perhaps briefly, because Sabello's got a big question, and mm. mine is a more political question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you uh, very much. Um, indeed, um, uh, this uh, question, I've heard it uh, being posed in many contexts about colonization of, of Africa, whether it's colonization or decolonization. I shouldn't speak the language that I don't know, but something to, to that effect, uh, uh, yeah. My experience um, has been that uh, because we come into collaboration as equal partners, um, where from uh, the inception of the study, we equally participate, where local knowledge uh, 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 becomes quite critical and I become a resource in that regard in terms of even uh, creating research questions uh, and in terms of uh, uh, core leadership of, of, of the work. And with uh, me being the principal investigator, uh, 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 you know, uh, equally with them. And in some cases, me being the principal investigators and others being collaborators uh, uh, slash core investigators, like even in terms of the projects that I'm doing now, um, uh, I, I found that. Uh, 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 it was it was amazing to have what I call inspired uh, collaborations, which I've written about in Vision Never Dies book, uh, uh, where I was an equal partner, uh, and and um, uh, I, I enjoyed, of course, the input that could have been made, and I must acknowledge the fact that what I have enjoyed the most has been the fact that. Uh, I would have a global view of what I may not have known at the time, just because I've got those other people on the ground. Uh, there's just one single experience I had with one particular American collaborator where, uh, you know, uh, it, it turned out that as a collaborator, you know, I was going to be a data collector. Um, and I had to come clean, you know, to say, I, I'm, I'm not a data collector, I'm a scientist. So uh, uh, I operate, uh, operate on the basis of equal partnership and our collaboration never lasted. We did that one project together and I stood my ground. And after that, I knew that this is not the kind of collaborator I want to, to, to keep. So you've got to, to, to know what you want and to go for mutual uh, partnership versus um, 
uh, a, a, you know, an unequal one where you don't actually even develop. You, you will not even become an independent scientist because you basically are an implementer. Thank you very much. Before I give a chance to Savelo to uh, ask his, uh, you know, uh, questions, uh, please, I must remind uh, the fellows uh, that uh, uh, Megan has uh, posted, you know, that link for you to make comments later at the end of the presentation and our conversation for your input for future reference and if we, you know, what it is that we might want to uh, call back Professor Refilo to come and uh, chat to us. Uh, mm -hmm. But before I give uh, Savelo a chance to ask his questions, one which is related to what Kate asked was mm -hmm. a question, you know, put in the commentary by Professor Van Westhuizen. And if you just reflect on this very quickly, funders have their own agenda. In some yeah. funders, not everyone, yeah. they've got their own agenda. And the question he asks, how do you, you know, shape your research based on the funders' agenda? And or do you just leave them if you feel that uh, it's not somewhere where you want to go? Just if you could quickly respond to that. Yes. Um, I, I do shun uh, funders that are not uh, uh, advancing the work that I, I do. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I'll tell you this uh, quickly that um, if you, you are looking for like your work is relevant, dynamic and whatnot, generally what one is thinking is what the funders are thinking because we are all trying to respond to, to current realities, uh, you know. So, so yeah, but definitely yeah. I choose, uh, I, I go for funders that, so, yeah. That, yeah. Thank you very much. There's the choice. Hello, do you want to come in please, your questions? Uh, I'll try and be brief because uh, I think you probably have just answered one of my questions now. Okay. Um, but I think one, or at least what, I, what I've found is that, you know, not all the work that is being done is going to have a direct impact to society. And if you think of people that work, I don't know, maybe in maths or physics, they may have a very, I don't know, very narrow understanding of something that doesn't have a, an, an immediate direct impact, right? So, so and I guess the, then the question becomes, um, how do we make sure that uh, almost we move out of, of our own rabbit holes that we normally do and then say that this actually has a relevance in, in the rest of society. Um, the other question that I had was around, uh, yeah, I guess you've just answered that question is, is, is that often what you find is that people then sort of do research on what is funded and on what, on what funders would like to fund. Like for example, if NIH is, has an interest, a specific interest in, in Africa on specific issues, they're more likely to fund it. And then as researchers, we say, oh, well, this is what they fund. So maybe that's, maybe I need to almost move my research towards that direction because that's what is being funded. But, but I mean, for us, uh, at least for, uh, you know, as younger researchers, uh, maybe that, that transition is not always easy, um, simply because, you know, you've been trained in a certain area and you, you're good at that aspect and probably you're still trying to diversify your research portfolio, but, but, but uh, you, you now have to face this issue that, well, maybe I need to actually redirect my research and, and you know, how do you, one actually thinks about that transition. Um, so, and I think the other point uh, is is around mentorship. I, for me, I think that is probably one of the key factors in success in research. Uh, it, it, I mean, without it, really, you may as well forget about your academic career. Um, you know, because I've seen it in many instances where. Um, I mean, particularly larger groups or larger collaborative groups uh, tend to 
have a guest that bigger supports this thing. Uh, and obviously funders like bigger support systems simply because they are more secure and the you know there is less risk in in you know if you compare it to funding an individual who you're not sure if they may or may not succeed mm. um and and obviously this this becomes also an issue because you know you don't just insert yourself into that system of large collaborative mm. groups you have to be you have to know someone and and that person has to i guess vouch for you and say i want you to succeed and uh, and i and i think that that actually is quite a quite a huge disadvantage actually to a lot of uh, younger academics i think a lot of them I, i'm not sure if universities you know have to really think about how they create these support networks because it's these networks that that ensures that people succeed and you if people people that find themselves outside of these networks chances are they're not going to make it so I, i just thought maybe uh, just to get your ideas on, around that mm. i'll leave the pacer question on the side <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much Savilo. i i knew you would have that <laughs> over to you prof Okay, thanks. And I'm going to try. To, I know I elaborate quite a lot. Um, uh, on the question of uh, uh, doing, uh, like doing research that is uh, uh, aligned to your niche without necessarily being driven uh, to chase funding uh, uh, or, or swaying your, your one from what they are doing to um doing something else because they are looking for funding i want to say that believe you me if you are innovative and you do high quality work uh, whether you are doing science for science uh, because there is a place for science for science science for curiosity we have to ask uh, uh, unanswered questions questions that uh, will help us tomorrow and they may not necessarily fit the profile of funding that is available but with the resilience perseverance uh, 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 and continued you know like consistency in that work uh, uh, there are various other ways you know it is not necessarily that uh, one has to apply for funding all the time um, i'll give you an example samrc you know one of the projects i have they approached me i didn't it was a non competitive uh, thingy like they just said we think you are the right person to do this and i said yes of course you are right and then they gave me funding it's it's from the uh, providence office you know so 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 when you you do your work and you get known for it there, there will be i mean giz i didn't apply i met uh, the the south africa representative you know and i told them about what i'd love to do and then we ended up having a three year contract uh, welcome to us when they supported me actually i didn't get what i had applied for but listening to me seeing my enthusiasm and you know, they couldn't dare not do something about it so they came back to me saying we are not giving you this but we are giving you that how about that and i'm like yes you know so so it was not something that was out there you know so a uh, cdc where i got a lot of funding you know uh, uh, uh 1.8 million us dollars is a cooperative agreement there was no call you, you know basically you write a proposal detailing the work that you want to do and its significance and what not and what not and then they look at it and then together you you work in that area with them for multi year multi million uh, uh, what do you call so so it, it is it is uh, uh, there are other avenues um and then in terms of um uh, collaborative um uh, groups yeah absolutely you know i uh, i am referred to as one of the sophisticated networkers um uh, 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 because i have exploited and i continue to exploit available uh, networks and so on yeah um it is true that um for young scientists to help be in those networks and so on is difficult on their own then needs need to be uh, a dedicated effort 
uh, I'll tell you, uh, uh, my first adventure was when my CEO chose me, uh, 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 you know, in the entire institution to take a, an overseas trip with him, I mean, with her, where we went to the very NIH, where uh, 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 various University George Washington University, we, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the South African embassy in the US, uh, uh, you know, I went uh, Emory, Johns Hopkins University, and she just said, no, I'm with one of my directors. There were executive directors uh, and whatnot, but she took me with that exposure, that decisiveness to say, I want her to see the world. She's younger than them. She needs this. You know, she's not going to develop it on her own. It set me uh, uh, on the road to success. But I must say that I could have easily not become successful if I didn't follow through and follow up and really uh, work towards making the exposure I got uh, 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 beneficial for me. So oftentimes you'll find that people expose you, but there's a lot, much more that on your own you've got to do. And sometimes I think people are put or exposed to opportunities, but they don't perceive them as such and they don't utilize them uh, as much as they should, you know. Thank you very much. I think the next session we should have is on networking because that's a critical, <laughs> important part even to open up of uh, collaboration. I know that this topic, we can go on forever. Uh, yeah. Professor Rafilwe, thank you very much for, you know, for sharing with us, uh, you know, the and I, I, you know, it's great to see the book that you've put together. I'm sure I, I hope it's accessible. Uh, you know, people can get to it quickly. And of course, we've gotten your slides. I'm sure fellows will actually use them effectively. I think the bottom line is what you indicated that, uh, you know, it, 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 it's time management, it's hard work. Um, and at the end of the day, you just never give up. It's like anything else. You simply have to dig in and, uh, and work with it. Not to say that they, you know, you know, the system, there are no bad people out there, but importantly, <laughs> simply cannot give up and say, well, you know, I, I'm not going to do it because I have failed on the first try and whatever the case may be. Just like we've said in, in publishing, just like we've said in everything yeah. else, and then our ratings and so on. And it's great uh, with your presentation. I think it's a very useful one. So I don't know if, uh, you know, if uh, Kate has got uh, the last comments, but before we do that, I would like to ask the fellows to just stay off, you know, stay on a little bit uh, because we want to have a short conversation. Kate, over to you. You want to say anything before we release uh, Professor Rafilwe? Prof Rafilwe, thank you so much. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of our FPP scholars that, uh, we would like to have you in person again, because uh, we really have to sit at the feet and listen. Uh, yeah. Thank you very, very much for this session. And um, I'm sure you're going to make yourself available. We will coerce you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. It's, it's, it's such a joy to share and definitely I'd love to continue. Thank you so much. But thank you very much, uh, Rafilo. You uh, you are re released. You can thank uh, you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, no, I if uh, if the, the the participants, the fellows from the uh, FPP, if you can stay on, uh, Megan and Kate have got uh, staff they want us to chat about. Uh, over to you, Megan. So over to Kirti. Kirti will start. Um. So this brings us to an end uh, for the sessions for 2022. Uh, Megan, please correct me. And we didn't want to impose on your time uh, because we know that this is uh, that terrible time of the year when uh, you are marking and uh, busy with such uh, closing off uh, matters at universities. Uh, we ourselves can barely breathe at the moment. And um, so we wanted to really say, and we will drop you a note, uh, giving you the plans for next year and telling you a little bit about it. 
Um, but it's been a wonderful journey with you. And um, I must say, it was delightful to meet some of you at Stellenbosch last week. And um, that was a memorable event. And uh, Sinead Barnabas uh, did us proud with facilitating a discussion with the Nobel Prize uh, laureate, uh, Professor Gurna. But today we also have good news uh, that has come through. And I thought we should celebrate that. And for everyone else who has uh, attained professorship or NRF rating, your moment will come in January. But for today, Aurelia, a very, very special congratulations on attaining your associate professorship. And as Sabello wisely points out, the remuneration is of course fantastic. And um, we are really, really proud of you. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.